Majora's Mask. Chapter 39. Seven seconds. The moon's angry, orange eye stared directly at him. It made his legs feel weak. The clock town guard had watched the moon gradually grow closer each day, but unlike everyone else, he couldn't flee, which is why he stood in an abandoned South Clock Town Plaza so late at night. He hadn't seen another person for over an hour, and still, the guard's shift was an eternity away from ending. He held his spear firmly in his right hand, his polished armor shone, and his visor remained drawn, but for no one. Fear was a small voice in the back of his head, and he couldn't give it any attention if he wanted to stay that way. His mom and sister were boarded up in West Clock Town, but looking at the moon, he knew it wouldn't do them any good. The steel gorget at his throat suddenly felt a little tighter. The Millers ran, the guard remembered, to the mountains. They'd loaded all their belongings into a wagon and headed for the mountains, Millie, if it still existed, and they'd have to get through unpredictable wildlife which might prove difficult with a daughter as young as theirs. There were rumors of the Dongos along the trail. I hope they made it, the guard thought though he also hoped his family would make it, by staying here. The guard shifted nervously, looking at the empty southern gate behind him. Why should I stand here like this? The guard thought. If everyone is fleeing, then who am I protecting? Who am I to tell a little kid they can't take their chances in Termina Field? And who would possibly enter Clock Town, when there's such a terrible threat hanging over us? He had to stop thinking. He was a town guard. And that was that. There were no ifs, ands, or buts. He stood between everyone in Clock Town and death. Unless, of course, death came from above in the form of a giant rock. Stop, he thought. Stop thinking like that. The guard steeled himself, bringing his chest high and staring straight ahead. He pretended not to see the moon in his peripheral, focusing on the clock tower and empty stalls. In a couple hours, he could decide what to do with his family. Then the other guard would take his place, if he was still here. No, no, look straight ahead. He squeezed his spear again, and suddenly the armor around his neck didn't feel so tight. His legs stopped shaking too. <sighs> You're fine. You're a god of Clock Town, freaking Clock Town, the biggest village in all of Termina. The moon won't fall. Everything would be fine, without a doubt. In fact, the moon almost boded well for him. It would keep scaring away all bandits or monsters, and there's no way it could fall all the way to the ground. He lightly struck his spear's bottom against the plaza floor, enjoying the echo it created. He also saw another villager crossing the plaza, and it reassured him that not everyone had left. He smiled. Then he realized he was hungry. Ah, <sighs> Din... There probably wasn't much food left since all the merchants had left. They'd have to break into their emergency stash of frozen Endura carrots. Unless they had enough bread stored in the... A sharp pain cut across his neck. It was thin and quick, but it burned. His gorget parted as if it were paper, and liquid warmth flowed over his armor's steel. All thoughts vanished as his mind went numb with panic. He let go of his spear clattered to the ground as his gloved hands went to his throat. When he opened his blood-stained lips, only choking noises came out, and all the strength he'd recovered in his legs vanished. He collapsed, noting the villager across the plaza. A cry came from him, and then he too fell to his knees, an arrow sticking from his back. The guard landed on his side, now staring at the southern gate as he bled out. In the darkness, he saw a pair of terrible eyes. The shadow they belonged to lowered its bow, and its other hand wielded a bloody sword. The bright red eyes were the last thing he saw. He crawled. The pain in his back was surreal. He couldn't stand. The arrow was stuck inside of him, forcing him to the ground every time he got to his knees. All he could do was pull himself forward away from the demon who'd slit the guard's throat. 
He groaned as he went crawling behind the nearest stall. Black boots were in front of his face before he made it. No, the injured man said. The villager shakily raised his head to see bright red eyes bearing down on him. The creature was darkness incarnate. Only the blood on its blade and eyes contrasted with the shadow given life. Please, tell, tell me where, where the stock pot in is, and I won't kill you. It spoke with a chilling, yet simple, authority, as if it was incomprehensible to challenge the monster's will. The villager remained shaking on the ground. He gulped, overwhelmed with panic as pain spread like fire from his back. It, it's up the stairs. His eyes watered as he pointed. It's the building. Under the town bell, across the plaza. The red eyes continued staring. Please, I told you I won't. The shadow raised its blade and swiftly brought it down. The villager's scream was silenced. The lobby was dark as she sorted the stockpot in's receipts. Tane had expected her daughter to be more organized than this. Hanchu knew better. Thankfully, no one was left at the hotel, so that gave her time to deal with her daughter's mess. The boy and fairy had been their final guests, stowed away in Anju's room. But they were gone now, too. Tane felt uneasy about the two of them. I swear, she thought, that boy and that fairy are involved in dark magic. Nothing good ever came of people who came from underneath the clock tower. The boy had been so terribly wounded, and he hadn't provided a coherent explanation as to why. I'd never say this aloud, but perhaps we should have let nature take its course with him, Tane thought. Like the old man all those years ago. All the old man had caused was gossip and a burial. No one had known where he came from, and no one had known his name. Link, on the other hand, promised to continue being a bad omen. It was the last thing her daughter needed, after the man whose name shall not be spoken had abandoned her. Tane sighed, closing the receipts drawer and walking to the hallway. She entered the kitchen, transferring the soup from their kettle to a large container. She grabbed a washcloth and scrubbed furiously at a spot on the kettle's bottom. The sound of swishing water in their cleaning basin filled her ears, but the rest of the inn was silent. Until she heard the front door close. Tane placed the pot down slowly and threw her towel on the counter. She walked toward the front desk, wiping her hands on her skirt. However... The lobby was empty. She walked to the counter and scanned the empty room. The door was shut, but she definitely heard it open. Tane strained to hear something, anything. Something's not right, she thought. When a creak came from the hidden staircase to her left, her heart skipped a beat. An intruder? A thief had clearly assumed the inn was empty, but had terrible timing. She'd been only minutes away from locking things up. And there was another step, and then another. Tane realized the intruder was headed for Anja's room. She gulped, quietly stepping into the kitchen and grabbing a large pot. She crept quietly past the desk, through the hallway, and around the staircase's back. Then, she stepped into the second floor's view. There was no one, on the stairs or at the top. She crept firmly up regardless, moving as softly as possible. She gripped her pot firmly, her only weapon. Then she saw something on the handrails. Blood. Her stomach lurched. Oh, Nehru, I should have grabbed my knife, she thought. But Tane didn't know any violent people in Clocktown. Clearly, she'd been naive. Tane abandoned her pursuit and went back down the stairs as her breathing became heavy. <laughs> grab the keys and get out grab the keys and get out she absentmindedly placed the pot on the desk as she opened a drawer sifting through the receipts madly for keys she refused to look up until she found them come on Hanju look at this mess where are the keys where, where are the she found them they jingled as she brought them into her palms she sighed with relief turning to be face to face 
with a pair of bright red eyes. Hanju's mom screamed. The keys fell to the floor as she backed into her desk. Her pupils were wide as she took in the dark being before her. It was as black as midnight, and it looked exactly like the boy, except a shadow. It even had a sword and shield behind its back. What are you? She asked. The dark being responded by retrieving a dagger from its belt. You have seven seconds to tell me where they went. They? She somehow knew exactly who the shadow referred to, but Anju was with them. She couldn't let this dark being know where they were. The three of them had left Romani's ranch only hours ago to take shelter from the moon. She had been right about everything. The boy was a dark omen, and now her family was in danger. I'm not telling you anything, she finally mustered. There was hardly any distance between them. There was no way around it, and she was too terrified to try crawling over the desk. She wouldn't be quick enough. The monster did not respond. It merely stood there, staring at her with red eyes, dagger drawn, counting. She panicked, wondering what number it was on, wondering if its threat was serious, wondering if she would die instantly. <sighs> Who, who are you? What do you want? No response. <laughs> Say something! I'm being serious, I... Her hand wrapped around her kitchen utensil's handle. I have a pot! As soon as seven seconds had passed, it took a step toward her, quicker than she'd imagined possible. She swung the pot with all her force, but the dark being wasn't phased. The pot went spiraling through the air. A trail of blood followed it. Minutes passed, and eventually, the dagger worked. She relented and told the shadow where they were. The caravan lurched upward. Link's stomach screamed in protest as he slammed back onto the hay. Oof! Tattle exclaimed, lying beside him. What? aware we're not racing anybody, right? It's not her fault, Link said, despite the pain begging him to stay quiet. Ugh, Nehru, the road leading out of Clocktown aren't intact. It's all overgrown. I'm sure it's just hard to drive through. Tattle glared irritably at the boy, but her annoyance quickly faded. The fairy sighed, lying back beside him. The cart kept shaking as they slowly rolled through Terminal Field. Link tried to ignore the instability of their small shelter. The wagon's curtains were drawn to protect them from the cold night, at least. Hay was their only other guest, and Anju drove the wagon alongside Romani Ranch's owner on the canvas's other side. Link gingerly clutched his wound. A blanket covered his bare torso while his mended clothes sat on the side. Bandages covered most of his injured body, and though he'd recovered some... His strength hadn't fully returned. He was nowhere close to running and could barely walk. The boy eyed his sword and shield nonetheless, wanting to be standing again as soon as possible. His blonde hair had been recently trimmed, and his bruises and scrapes, thankfully, had begun to fade. But the wound on his stomach simply couldn't heal. He saw Great Bay's waves towering skyward, the sky was a tumultuous mixture of purple, red, and black. He looked into the terrible eyes of the reeded mask, forced down to his knees. He looked sadly at Tattle trapped within her bottle, unable to reach her. He looked into his own eyes, glowing purple and terrifying as he screamed in pain. He could hear the cogs turning beneath the clock tower. Link shook his head. He needed to go back to freeing the giants. Sitting here mulling over everything was too much. He needed adventure. He needed a distraction. He needed to end this quest. He looked at the fairy resting beside him and wondered if she struggled with all this rest too. He wondered if she could even think, being a shadow and all. No, the hero thought. The masked salesman doesn't know what he's talking about. Another bump. Link's stomach cringed again and Tattle scoffed. <sighs> Get there soon, the fairy said. 
I still think we should have played the Song of Time at the inn. Then I just fall over as soon as I appeared, Link said, an edge to his voice. I want to get as much rest as possible before I play it. Why would these last couple of hours make a difference? Kremia can help. She has more medicine back at her house than Shikashi. Right, Tuttle said. I'm sure this has nothing to do with you cutting it as close as possible every cycle. You thrive off the adrenaline. Maybe if someone's trying to kill us five seconds before the moon falls again, you'll feel better. Tuttle! Link exclaimed. His stomach hurt even more after shouting, and Tuttle's back was still to him. She took a moment to meet his eyes, but didn't say anything. <sighs> Are you okay? Link said. Oh, I'm just perfect! The fairy said. Never been better than I am now in this dismal, meaningless world of ours. Daddle. No, Link. I don't want to talk about it. The mask salesman did plenty of talking already. Let me just lay here. Link uncertainly averted his gaze. His eyes became heavier as their journey continued. But the hero shot awake right before sleep every time. Eventually, but not soon enough, the wagon came to a complete stop. Then Anju peeked inside. We're here, she said. Link crawled toward the caravan's mouth, grimacing with pain, and Anju supported him so that his bandaged feet could successfully reach the grass, while Tattle carried his bag. The boy bared his teeth and took in Romani Ranch. The wagon's opening faced a long dirt road. It stretched into the foreseeable distance, going underneath a large sign whose back faced him. Romani Ranch was an open field of grass and hay with a few trees scattered here and there. Two large buildings were further in the distance, but two smaller ones sat closer, just behind their parked caravan. One was a wooden barn, and across from it was a small home. The barn appeared empty and silent. The house seemed just as dark and vacant. A girl sat on a crate outside of the barn. She appeared much younger than Link and wore a long, white dress. She had red hair that came to her waist. The ranch's namesake simply sat there in the dark, staring off into the distance. Link hobbled in her direction to follow Kremia, who was the ranch's owner that accompanied Anju on the drive. Kremia was around Anju's age and looked identical to Romani, just older and taller. They were sisters, tasked with running the ranch on their own. Kremia's brow wrinkled when she reached her sister. Romani, what are you doing? You, you, practice? The young girl said. Link didn't understand that response. He watched Kremia bend beside her sister, placing a hand on her shoulder. The young girl, named Romani, simply stared ahead with vacant eyes. You shouldn't be out here like this, Kremia said. In the cold, you need to go inside. Practice, Romani said strangely. I need to... I don't remember, but I need to... to practice. Kremia looked back at Link, Anju, and Tattle's confused faces. She straightened herself, nudging Romani off the crates to join them. Sorry, Romani. Ever since the cows disappeared. Link turned to the empty barn beside them. Disappeared? Kremia sighed. Sorry, let's just go inside. She led Romani in that direction, who hardly appeared capable of keeping up. Link limped behind them, but Tattle abruptly fell behind. The hero heard the bag fall from her fingers and hit the dirt road. Link turned to see what was wrong. His fairy pointed ecstatically elsewhere. <gasps> Look! <gasps> Link noted a small pen outside the two-story home. A wooden roof and metal gate sealed the pen off, housing dirt, hay, and a horse. The steed's sleek brown coat and white mane were exactly how he remembered it. Epona's black eyes stared at the newcomers, buzzing her lips. Link's shocked expression quickly turned to a smile. E e <gasps> Epona! He gasped. He walked excitedly toward her, almost falling over before Anju came to support him. Link, what are you? It's my horse, Link said, continuing toward her as he smiled, near laughing. It's Sabona! The horse recognized him too. She nuzzled on the metal gate as if to reach him, but Link closed the space between them himself. He reached out his hand tentatively, 
as if afraid she would vanish before his fingers could stroke her coat. But she didn't. The soft, warm fur on her nose was familiar. It was home. Epona neighed softly and content, closing her eyes and bowing her head. Everything else in the world faded into the background. For a moment, the war had been won. He'd been reunited with one of his greatest loves, and all the suffering in the world became quiet before such overwhelming joy. Tattle and Anju watched behind him as Kremia rejoined them. Do you ride? The ranch owner asked. Yes, the lynx said, still smiling, despite his pale, shrunken, and injured appearance. Where did you find her? Find her? Kremia said. Is she yours? Link nodded, still scratching Epona gently. She was stolen from me. The Skull Kid brought her here and then got rid of her, I thought. Link furrowed his brow, wondering how much of that was true. The horse chase had been fabricated, hadn't it? And how could Epona have been brought all the way down the tunnel anyways, assuming there had ever been a tunnel? Link realized even then he still didn't have all the answers about getting to Termina. If he hadn't stumbled upon a hole and fallen, then how exactly had the masked salesman sent him here? The next time his blue eyes met Epona's, he realized she had to be a phantom, a ghost, like Tattle, like everyone else in this realm. Epona seemed to sense his uneasiness, pushing up against his hand as if to reassure him. Link's smile still faltered. These aren't, aren't real, real people, people, Link, the masked salesman had said. Stop, Stop pretending, pretending they're, they're something, something they're, they're not. not. Your, Your love, love is misplaced. Is misplaced. A, shadow a shadow doesn't have a heart. We found her wandering Termina Field about three days ago, Kremia said. Three days ago was before the cycle had started, before he'd come through the clock tower doors. It was now the final night, and there were only hours left. We've been taking care of her, but if she's yours, then... Link turned to face Kremia, nodding. Thank you. She's the last thing I have left of home. Then it's my honor to reunite you two. She left them, walking to unload the caravan still sitting outside their home. Anju stepped forward. Hmm. It'll probably be a few days before you're well enough to ride, though. Link looked up to see the moon blotting out the waning evening and its magnificent crimson canvas. I'm not sure we have a few days, Link said. We should go inside, Anju said, eyeing the moon herself. We can move your horse into the stables before... She trailed off, not entirely sure how to finish the sentence. Visions of the wasteland threatened to return to Link, but he ignored them. Thankfully... He had the key to survival, and it lay in the bag Tattle had just picked back up. Thank you. Link took one more moment with his steed. He brushed his face against Epona's, closing his eyes. She buzzed her lips with contentment again. I found you, girl. I promise I'll always come back to protect you, no matter what. Link sat at the table across from Romani and Kremia, and Anju sat beside he and Tattle. The boy found it hard to keep his eyes away from Romani as he ate his potatoes. Kremia's younger sister kept staring vacantly at her plate. Whenever she spoke, she only mumbled incoherently about practice. Romani, you have to eat. Kremia brought the spoon up to her sister's mouth, and even then, Romani refused to acknowledge the food. It took several attempts before she hesitantly took a small bit of potatoes. Kremia celebrated the small victory with a smile. There you go. She turned to see Anju, Link, and Tattle watching them. Is there anything we can do to help? Anju asked. The moon answered her with another quake that shook the house. Kremia let that be the final word on the matter. What happened to her? Link asked. Was it the Skull Kid? Kremia's brow furrowed. The Skull Kid? No. At least I don't think so. It was two days ago. In the middle of the night, this bright light woke me up. It came from outside the window, but when I went out there, I didn't see anything. And I couldn't find Romani. The cows were gone, too. 
I searched all night for her, for them, for a sign of anything, but I didn't find her until the next morning. She came walking on her own down the dirt path, but she, she wasn't the same. She was holding this lantern with a strange light in it, and I asked her where she'd been, but she couldn't tell me. I tried to take the lantern away, but she attacked me. And ever since, Crimea shook her head, unable to hold back tears. She wiped them away quickly, even as Romani remained completely unaware of her sister's sadness. Then, another noise interrupted them. Fireworks. It was now midnight, and the carnival had arrived. Six hours remained. Surprisingly, Romani heard them too, and she looked up from her meal to try and find their source. When she couldn't see anything from the window, the young girl ran outside. Oh, Romani, no! Kremia went to follow her leaving Anju, Link, and Tattle. The innkeeper broke their silence. You two should get some rest. Can I help you upstairs, Link? Sure. Anju guided him to his bedroom for the night. His stuff lay on a bed near the window, across the room from the door. Link walked over to the window, looking out to see the empty barn and harrowing midnight sky. If you need anything, just let me know, Anju said. Link nodded taking note of the innkeeper's sad tone as she left. She has her own problems, Link thought. She wanted to wait in clock down for cafe. But her mother had talked her out of it, who would soon be joining them at Romani Ranch for shelter soon. It's hot in here, the fairy said, breaking his train of thought. How much longer are we waiting before we play the Song of Time? In an hour or two. I want to take a nap before it's suddenly six in the morning, three days before again. It'll be a long crawl all the way back to Stockpot Inn. Tuttle scoffed, flying to the window. Well, at least open this before you do. It's really warm. The fairy remained floating there, staring out at the dark sky, transfixed. The blood in Link's veins froze when he peered into the re-dead creature's lifeless face. Knelt into the forest grass, he could do nothing but watch as Navi's screams still echoed in his mind. He swore he saw a pair of eyes hidden behind its empty skull, and the world spun. Link collapsed, and everything faded to black. Consciousness returned for a moment. He lay on his stomach over Epona, ropes securing him tightly to his horse. Epona walked calmly forward. Link lifted his head to see the cloaked figure who'd attacked him. It was facing away from him, and his horse's reins were in its gloved hands, leading her onward. They were on a rocky cliff with the forest to their right, and a sharp edge on their left. A body of stormy water splashed onto the cliff and dashed the rocks with foam. Ahead was a small shack, gray and feeble. The structure was weathered and ancient. The figure approached it, and Link's head fell limply back onto his horse as darkness returned. Time slipped away from him again. When the world returned next, the cloaked figure was unfastening him from the horse. Link's blurred vision barely made out the face of his attacker. It no longer took on the form of a redead. Instead, it looked like a bird, an eagle. Epona seemed drawn to the face, and Link watched as she tried to lick it. The stranger pushed her gently away as he continued untying the boy. Then Link was lying against the shacks outside, head lolled to the side. He saw his kidnapper on his knees several feet away. His hood was down, and red hair blew gently in the wind. The man cried into his hands over a lifeless fairy sprawled over his palms. Crimea sat on the crate outside, holding Romani close as her younger sister nuzzled into her arms. They sat in the cold dark, and Kremia openly wept as Romani cuddled with a wide, vacant expression on her face. Please, please come back to me, Romani, Kremia said. Please. Romani spoke distantly. We need to, to practice, Kremia, before they come. Kremia held her even tighter, wishing more than anything that she'd listened. Romani had been right. Her little sister had tried to warn her that something bad would happen, and she hadn't listened, and now it was too late. They remained on the crate for quite a while, 
Only a lantern's light by the front door protected them from the early morning's strange aura. Kremia held Romani close as she began to fall asleep. Thankfully, the air outside was quite warm, despite the moon's harrowing presence. When the owner of the ranch looked up next, however, something else stared at them. Red, merciless eyes were suddenly only feet away. It stood right off the road and before the crate, somehow completely silent in its approach. Kremia screamed, jumping off and pulling Romani with her, startling her younger sister awake. However, the dark creature was already upon them. It was a shadow, shaped in the young, injured boy's image. The monster grabbed Romani's wrist and tore her away from Kremia, and then a dagger was up against her throat as the shadow held Romani firmly in place. No! Kremia exclaimed. Her last-ditch effort to rescue her sister ended as soon as she saw the drawn weapon. Romani gasped, suddenly present enough to recognize danger. She whimpered as the blade drew a thin line of blood. The attacker's blood-red eyes never looked away from Kremia. You have seven seconds to give me the boy. The air caught in Kremia's throat. Just let her go, please! The creature said nothing and merely held the dagger steady. Its eyes harbored only darkness. Nothing within them promised mercy. Kremia? Romani stammered, trying her best not to move as the blade bit into her. No! Kremia fell to her knees. They're upstairs. Please don't hurt my sister. Please. He's upstairs in the bedroom asleep. Just don't kill Romani. The shadow's red eyes never wavered, and neither did the weapon in its hand. The air held its breath, waiting. The shadow lowered its knife and threw her into the ground, abandoning them to enter the house. Romani curled into a ball and began to cry in the dirt as her older sister bent beside her. Kremia scooped her up and held her close. Thankfully, the injury on her neck was minor. I'm right here, Kremia said, whispering. I'm right here. A brilliant wave of heat suddenly filled the air. Kremia turned to see fire spreading across her house's front. The broken lantern was still in the shadow's hand, which it swiftly discarded like trash. Orange, red, and yellow crackled with life and spread across their wooden abode. Epona screamed in terror, backing away from the metal gate as the fire neared her pen. No! No! Kremia screamed, scrambling to her feet with Romani still in her arms. She faced the house for only a moment longer, but the shadow stared back, daring her to try anything. Kremia's face was still wet with tears when she gave up, running down the street and away from her home. Her catatonic sister never said another word. Link awoke to Kremia's scream. His head shot up from his pillow, and the images of the masked salesman faded with his dream. He turned to see Tattle startled awake as well. They'd stared at one another for a moment, uncertain as to what they'd heard. The fairy flew to the open window and peered outside. Uh, it's that shadow thing, the fairy said. What are you talking about? Link asked. His body was still stiff, and his stomach seared in pain at the rough awakening. From Woodfall Temple! Remember when that evil spirit in Odawa's mask made a copy of you, and you absorbed it inside of your scar? The boy remembered Dark Link immediately. But, Link said, stammering, that's not possible. He was inside of me, a part of the scar. How could he have gotten out? Then, he recalled the Skull Kid ripping a piece of dark magic from his chest. Its strange, lifelike tentacles had been carried away by his adversary. The Skull Kid, Link said with realization. He took Dark Link out. It's working for him now. The hero threw his covers off, standing slowly. He grabbed his bag, checking that everything was there. His four masks, two pickaxes, money, matches, lens of truth, clothes, and ocarina. These were the only possessions he had left. Except... Then let's play the freaking song and get out of here! Tattle said. But my sword and shield and Epona, they're all outside. A brilliant light, followed by heat, came from the window. Flames quickly stretched to reach the house as they crackled, and another scream soon followed from downstairs. Anjus, 
Link opened his bag, scrambling through his possessions as the smell of burning wood reached him. He pulled the clay instrument free, not allowing a moment to feel guilt as he put it to his lips. He heard his horse screaming outside, but tried to ignore her as he let the song's notes free. Something struck his face. Link's head flew violently to the side before he could finish the song, and his jaw rang with pain. His ocarina spiraled away along with a dagger, which had drawn a fresh wound across his face. The clay flute spun out the window and into the late night. Link grasped his bloody cheek and turned to the bedroom door. There stood Dark Link. Red eyes honed in on its target as smoke bellowed from the kitchen downstairs. It didn't waste a second, and neither did the boy. The shadow drew a bow from his back and notched an arrow as Link dove for the dagger at his feet. Link threw the weapon back at its owner, and Dark Link's eyes widened. The monster sidestepped the projectile gracefully. The weapon clattered down the stairs and out of sight. Link grabbed his bag and ran for the window, flinging himself outside as an arrow soared just by him. The fall was short and quick. Link landed on his shoulder. No scream could possibly express the pain that followed. He pushed through his spiraling vision to stand as Tattle flew out the bedroom to join him. Link's ocarina lay in the grass nearby, and he grabbed it as he stumbled from the burning house. It was now a torch, loud and uproarious as it claimed the house's right side. Epona neighed loudly, backed as far into the pen as she could from the flames. Link ran blindly toward the wagon, fighting back nausea caused by his excruciating fall. He saw Andre running away from the ranch some distance down the road, though Kremia and Romani were even further ahead of her. Link, he's coming! Tattle's voice was right behind him, but he barely heard it. I have to get to the wagon! Link thought. His sword and shield were there, and it would provide shelter for him to play the Song of Time quickly, but he fell mere feet away from safety. Link collapsed onto his stomach, his face in the dirt, and his body in agony. No, Link, get up! Link turned to see Dark Link emerge from the burning house. Its red eyes were as bright as the fire, and its black boots were noiseless as it stepped toward the fallen hero. The monster drew its shadowy blade into its left hand, the steel ringing into Termina's final night. Link could only lay on his back and watch as the shadow stood over him, raising its sword to end his life. Epona neighed a triumphant battle cry. Her hooves clomped through the dirt toward them, abandoning her burning pen, its metal gate bent and askew. Epona's hooves came upon the shadow, repeatedly trampling the monster into the ground. The shadow's sword left its fingertips as its body became one with the dirt. The fire raged behind her as she pulverized their enemy. When Epona stepped away from the dark being, the shadow was mangled and grievously injured, but no blood had been spilled. Its red eye still looked up angrily from the ground, its remaining arm reaching for something. Epona shook her head in triumph, bending down to nuzzle her fallen owner. Link couldn't help but smile as he reached up to pet her. The pain was still surreal, however, and reality was quick to return when he saw the shadow begin to stand. Its body reconstructed itself. Dark Link returned to life as if Epona had never harmed it. No, Link exhaled as Epona backed away from the resurrecting shadow. Link stood, using Epona as support, and saw his fairy exiting the caravan. Tattle barely managed to carry his sword, looking aghast when she noticed their rising attacker. With his remaining strength, Link scrambled atop his horse. Go! Epona obeyed, running on all fours as fast as possible. Link clung to her neck desperately as her bare back jabbed into his injuries and made them worse. The boy squeezed his eyes shut. The fire's crackling died as they left the ranch behind. He heard arrows soaring beside them, barely missing their targets. Amidst all the chaos and pain, however, Link took joy in riding his horse again. Bona, Link thought. It's really you. You saved me. He allowed the sounds of their flight to calm him, his horse's hooves in the dirt, the wind running through his hair, the town bells in the distance. They would be safer now. They slowed once they were deep in the woods, and Tattle caught up to them completely out of breath. She dropped the sword on the ground, sighing with relief. Link tried to get off his horse, but ended up collapsing alongside his weapon. <sighs> Din, Link thought, wondering how much more pain was possible for a human to bear. Tattle floated beside him, and the hero could only lay next to his bag, ocarina, and sword. Link, 
she said worriedly. What are we going to do? We just erased all the healing you did these past three days. Shikashi won't be enough. Link barely managed to shake his head. He won't, but I have a better idea. The Great Fairy. Tattle took a moment to make the connection. She, after all, had been the first person to help Link in Clocktown. The fairy nodded with uncertainty. All right, but you should play the Song of Time before you can't anymore. She looked up at the sky. We only have a couple hours left. Link sat up and scooped his possessions close. Tattle flew to his shoulder, and the hero leaned back against his horse. He smiled, content to finally be taking her with him. Link played his ocarina, with Epona and Tattle close. <laughs>